speaking from Cairo. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be with you in this live event. Uh, as you may be aware, along the last three months or even more, people are telling nothing about COVID-19, which changed actually our life significantly. However, in this live webinar, we will be focusing about the possible correlation between this COVID-19 and diabetes. Uh, and with this, uh, I would like to introduce uh, my dear friend, Robert Eckel. Bob is actually professor of medicine in the chronology department in the University of Colorado. And he is a current president of the American Diabetes Association. Because we have some, some French speaking uh, attendees, so we are happy to get aboard uh, uh, Dr. Hend Raki. She is professor of endocrinology in Rabat University, and she will be helping in doing some summary every, every now and then during the presentation of Bob. Hend, would you like to tell a few words in French before we start? Of course, thank you, Mahmoud. Euh, bonjour à tous. Euh, comme le docteur Mahmoud vient de le dire, euh, c'est une euh, réunion autour d'un thème qui reste d'actualité euh, dans nos vies et qui va le rester encore euh, quelques temps euh, sur euh, le Covid-19 et le diabète. Euh, le, comme euh, nous avons des participants euh, qui sont francophones, je vais faire un résumé euh, à la fin de chaque partie euh, du euh, professeur Ekel qui nous fait l'honneur aujourd'hui de partager avec lui ses connaissances sur le sujet. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob. Well, it's good to be with you again. I guess it's evening time where you're at. It's just a little bit afternoon where I live. I'm eight hours behind you. And uh, I suspect that uh, in the United States, we're catching up with everyone in terms of this coronavirus infection. So what Mahmoud has asked me to do is update you on the relationship between COVID-19 infection and patients living with diabetes. And by the way, this is an area that I've been quite active in as president of science and medicine for the American Diabetes Association. And the platform changes almost daily in terms of new information that's been forthcoming about the relationship between COVID-19 and diabetes. Okay, my own slides are advancing. Okay, so the objectives for this evening are first, are patients with diabetes at increased risk of COVID-19? The second question we'll address, are patients with diabetes with infection from the coronavirus at increased risk for hospitalization, ICU admission, assisted ventilation, and mortality? The third is to bring up some considerations for patients with diabetes who require hospitalization with COVID-19 infection. The third is the impact of hyperglycemia on outcomes in patients with or without diabetes, by the way, who have COVID-19 infection and are hospitalized. And finally, questions related to drug management and hospitalized patients with diabetes and the coronavirus infection. We'll cover briefly, not each one of these in great detail, but insulin, metformin, the SGLT2 inhibitors, the GLP-1 receptor agonists, the DPP-4 inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, the ARBs, and finally, hydroxychloroquine. And? Donc, uh, je vais enchaîner en français. Euh, L'objectif de euh, ce topo sur l'actualité de l'infection COVID-19 et le diabète, nous avons cinq parties. La première des questions, c'est est-ce que les diabétiques sont à risque élevé de contracter le COVID-19 Deuxième question, est-ce qu'un diabétique qui est déjà atteint de COVID-19 est à risque élevé d'hospitalisation en unité de soins intensifs, mais également de ventilation assistée et de mortalité Et enfin, la conduite pratique pour les patients diabétiques lorsqu'ils sont aussi, comment se prémunir de l'infection. 
l'impact de l'hyperglycémie sur les complications et nous verrons l'impact à la fois sur les sujets diabétiques et les non-diabétiques. Et enfin, comment prendre en charge et comment adapter les thérapies des patients diabétiques atteints de COVID-19 en passant par l'insuline, la metformine, les SGLT2 inhibiteurs, agonistes du récepteur au GLP1, mais aussi les antihypertenseurs comme les IEC et les ARA2, et enfin l'hydroxychloroquine. Thank you, Hen. Merci, I should say. So what I'm going to do up front is indicate that I've been uh, privileged to be a co-author on a paper that's just been released in the Lancet uh, Endocrinology and Diabetes entitled Practical Recommendations for the Management of Diabetes in Patients with COVID-19. Keep in mind that this uh, platform of science and medicine is changing. So there's been some update that I'll try to cover today subsequent to this article being in press and now available to you in the readership community. I'm going to turn back to this manuscript several times during my presentation because it does summarize a worldview in terms of approaching patients with diabetes who are infected with COVID-19. So let's deal with the first question. Are patients with diabetes at increased risk of COVID-19? And I'm gonna quote where the ADA has positioned themselves at this time. And that's to say, there's not enough data to show whether people with diabetes are more likely to get COVID-19 than the general population. The problem people with diabetes face is primarily a problem of worse outcomes, not greater chance of contracting the virus. And that'll be our second question. So keep in mind, this is population science to know whether people with diabetes are at greater risk when, by the way, many people who are infected have no symptoms is a very difficult task to address. In general, we know patients with diabetes have alterations in innate immunity, the ability to fight off organisms that are presented to the body, the body surface through the aerosols into our lungs or things that we might ingest but that doesn't necessarily translate to COVID-19 at this time. So right now the position is, we're not sure people with diabetes are at greater risk. But now the second question before us is a more important one that relates to our patients living with diabetes who do have sufficient symptomatology from the infection to be ultimately presenting to the emergency departments of our hospitals are hospitalized and potentially admitted to the intensive care unit with assisted ventilation and mortality. This is a busy slide, gonna review each of these lines of evidence to try to support with convincing data that patients with diabetes do less well. The first are data from the United States from the Center for Disease Control, which monitors the epidemiology of such infections in the population as a whole. They looked at data up to April 8th of this year and found out that 28.3% of 1,482 hospitalized patients with COVID-19 in the US states had diabetes. And by the way, 48% had obesity. And that was published about three weeks ago in Mortal Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, which is really an updated presentation of existing epidemiological data that relate to the US as a country as a whole. Then we have the New York City hospital experience with data gathered between March the 1st and April the 4th, where 33.4% of 5,700 hospitalized patients with COVID-19 had diabetes. And in that population, 47% had obesity. And by the way, just a point on the side, obesity now is being recognized an increased risk factor for poor outcomes, just as diabetes is. I'm not saying they're equal, but clearly obesity is finding itself in the absence of diabetes also to be a risk factor for poor outcomes. Then I'm gonna turn thirdly to Italian data from the Lombardy region, which is the area in Italy that's been enriched with COVID-19 infections. And here are the data is over a shorter interval from February the 20th to March the 8th. In that hospitalized, hospitalized uh, 
category of the geographic spread of the coronavirus, 17% of 1,043 patients admitted to the ICU had diabetes. So that's a bit less, but the interval of study is less. And I'm not sure whether those data are actually uh, you know, taking place now with updated databases from the Italian experience. Then Hawaii et al. published a systematic review and meta-analysis of 30 studies, including 6,000 plus inpatients with diabetes and COVID-19 pneumonia. And ultimately patients with diabetes had a worse outcome, including mortality, severe infection, i.e. sepsis, assisted ventilation requirements, ARDS with a relative risk ratio of 2.38, in other words, a two to three times higher risk of acute respiratory distress syndrome. And it's important to know that age and hypertension were included in the analyses and were important inverse covariates. That means older patients who were hypertensive and also had diabetes appeared to contribute to that outcome to some extent. Then another systematic review published uh, more recently in the Journal of Infection and meta-analysis of 13 studies involving fewer patients, and there is some overlap between this analysis and that done by Huang et al. Here we're looking at 3,000 plus patients until March the 20th. So in a sense, this is a little bit uh, further down the line than in fact the, the database that was used in the previous systematic review. And here patients with diabetes had an odds ratio of 3.68 with the coefficients of variation shown in parentheses with a very high significant difference between their risk for critical illness or mortality. And finally, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine just last week published a course of patients in China between December and late January. It's kind of interesting that you know, some of these papers are published after other papers that have extended beyond certain dates were already published. But nevertheless, this one made the New England Journal of Medicine. And here, nearly 30% of 1,000 plus patients with the ICU admission, assisted ventilation, and death were patients who had di diabetes. Now, keep in mind, diabetes could be type 2 diabetes. It could be type 1 diabetes. And often there are covariates like hypertension, like older age, like existing lung disease or heart. And my apologies to everyone. We had an internet lockdown to the entire house. Every computer in the house was affected. Fortunately, we're back up and operating and I hope we're going to be able to continue to do this. So let me summarize the data as it exists. And I should point out the Italian experience where 17% of those reaching the ICU had diabetes. We don't know what percentage of patients who were hospitalized in fact had diabetes. But overall, my estimates are that pa patients with diabetes who are infected with COVID-19 are approximately three times more likely to be in the hospital than the general prevalence of diabetes in the community. And that may differ in the Middle East, in Morocco or Egypt, Iran or wherever, or in the Far East. We just don't really know other countries in terms of how that relates to the prevalence of diabetes. But most importantly for us, endocrinologists or people who treat people with diabetes is that the likelihood of a more complicated illness or death from COVID-19 is about two to three times higher. So hin to you en français, s'il vous plaît. Je déjà parlé sur la première partie lorsque vous n'étiez pas là. Je vais re-résumer. Donc la question qui se pose, c'est est-ce que les diabétiques sont à risque élevé de contracter le COVID-19 Le professeur Eckel s'est basé sur une recommandation publiée dans le Lancet le 23 avril, mais il a bien insisté sur le fait qu'avec cette maladie, on apprend au fur et à mesure, et donc il faut au quotidien. Il n'y a par contre pas de preuves solides comparées à la population générale, et c'est endorsé par l'ADA, que les diabétiques peuvent contracter le COVID-19, sont à risque élevé justement. Surtout parce qu'il y a des patients asymptomatiques et donc pour avoir des résultats concordants, ce n'est pas toujours facile. Il a aussi parlé des études sur le sujet. Ce qui est clair par contre, c'est que les résultats sont évidentes pour dire qu'un patient diabétique va avoir plus, un plus mauvais pronostic qu'un sujet non diabétique de faire des complications, à savoir des infections sévères, 
mais aussi d'être hospitalisé en unité de soins intensifs avec ventilation, mais également un sur-risque de mortalité, que ce soit des diabétiques de type 1 ou des diabétiques de type 2. Les diabétiques ont deux à trois fois plus de risques de complications aiguës, comme je l'ai dit, ou de mortalité non diabétiques, en rapportant un autre facteur de risque qu'est l'obésité. Il a parlé d'une étude américaine, comme vous l'avez vu, où l'obésité a un risque de, de, de complications du Covid, avec 5700 patients hospitalisés, parmi eux, 33,4% étaient diabétiques et n'oublions pas, 47,1% étaient obèses. Donc, c'est multiples facteurs de risque, que ce soit l'HPA, le diabète, l'obésité, mais aussi les maladies respiratoires, vont entraîner un risque de problématiques et de mortalité. Thank you, Professor Eckert. Ah, très bien. Merci beaucoup, Gwen. So, I should point out before I go on, what you see behind me is not real time. This is a photo I happened to take on Easter Island a number of years ago that makes a background that's much more satisfactory to my wife who likes to walk back and forth behind <laughs> me. <laughs> All right, the next uh, point of consideration is how patients with diabetes need to be prepared for hospitalization. And I think ultimately this relates to the recent document I referred to at the beginning of the talk in that in terms of outpatient care, let's deal with that first. The prevention of infection and diabetes is really not that different than anyone else other than maybe taking extra steps uh, in precaution from being exposed to the environment filled with COVID-19 virus. So the sensitization with patients is uh, possibly modified by control. So we're, we're always trying to achieve optimal control of diabetes based on A1C is the usual metric. So I think optimization of the current therapy is always appropriate to reach the predetermined glycemic goals. And I think it's important for patients to be informed at this time, they're not to stop any of their medications unless they are hospitalized and that's gonna be the next step. And also I think clearly outpatient visits now, I'm sure around the world are utilizing telemedicine or other connected health models if possible to maintain this social distancing that we've been recommending from all over the world. Now, once hospitalized, I think there are patients who in fact are infected, who in fact get hyperglycemic, and I'm gonna to return to that in a few minutes. So if in fact the stress of the illness results in hyperglycemia, this may be a new diagnosis of typically type two diabetes. I guess it could be type one also. But we often see this in the coronary care unit where people who had no known glucose intolerance or maybe had prediabetes in the ICU or CCU now have glucoses that are above you know, 10, 12 millimolar or in milligrams per DL above 180 or 200 milligrams per deciliter. So I think that relates to new onset hyperglycemia that really I think does relate to care of these patients in the hospital. Secondly, I think patients with diabetes who are require special attention and that frequent glucose monitoring, measurements of electrolyte and fluid balance, ketones, including beta hydroxybutyrate, which we all know is more specific than blood ketones, general ketones or urine ketones. And I think here intravenous insulin may be required and that's typically in the ICU setting. We've had recent changes in the United States where the Federal Drug Administration or FDA has allowed more permissive use of glucose monitoring using continuous glucose monitoring devices by the patient in their rooms. And also occasionally nursing staff can ultimately take care of DKA in the absence of an ICU admission. However, I think we all feel better when our patients who are in DKA are being administered intravenous insulin under a closer setting. Now keep in mind the advantage of CGM on the floor is that patients don't have to be having their fingers sticked regularly to assess their glucose monitoring. And this spares the healthcare profession from being unduly exposed to people with COVID-19 with diabetes that maybe can be bypassed by CGM at the bedside. So I think these are things that are important for the healthcare provider, for all of you to know, and the patient to know when he or she enters the hospital. By the way, patients who are on insulin infusion pumps or in fact, 
on CGMs, no matter what type of CGM, they should bring their devices and all of their medications with them to the hospital to make sure there's no confusion about how they're being managed as an outpatient and how that may translate to inpatient management. So don't forget to tell your patients if they're on a pump or use CGM to bring those devices with them. En français, s'il vous plaît. Alors, euh, la partie de la préparation des patients euh, diabétiques, euh, que ce soit des patients euh, euh, hospitalisés, mais aussi euh, comment essayer de prévenir euh, l'infection. Finalement, euh, le, comment prévenir l'infection, il n'y a pas beaucoup de différence avec les sujets non diabétiques. Euh, le, il faut continuer les mesures de prévention. Maintenant, il est clair qu'il faut faire une, plus de sensibilisation et d'éducation thérapeutique pour expliquer aux patients que l'équilibre glycémique est primordial. Il faut que, idéalement, l'hémoglobine glycée soit aux objectifs et, bien entendu, expliquer aux patients, s'ils ne sont pas équilibrés, comment intensifier les traitements et utiliser la télémédecine, par exemple, dans ces cas-là mais également adapter euh, les traitements. Alors, euh, surtout, surtout, répéter aux patients qu'ils ne doivent pas, lorsqu'ils sont en ambulatoire, arrêter leur traitement parce que cela risque d'aider euh, le, le, le diabète et donc euh, d'entraîner des complications. Maintenant, euh, pour euh, les patients hospitalisés ou qui sont, euh, que ce soit dans une, un service froid ou en unité de soins intensifs, d'abord, il faut euh, s'attacher à prévenir et traiter les infections. Ensuite, ne pas oublier d'intensifier l'autosurveillance glycémique et même euh, d'en faire plus que d'habitude pour pouvoir vérifier que les glycémies restent au nord. Euh, du sang et les bandelettes urinaires. Maintenant, pour les patients qui ont un CGMS, eh bien, il est important de le garder pour le côté pratique, que ce soit pour le patient qui ne va pas se piquer, mais aussi pour les soignants. Et également insister sur le fait que les patients, lorsqu'ils vont venir à l'hôpital, ceux qui sont sous insuline doivent garder leur traitement. L'insulinothérapie est par ailleurs à privilégier dans ces unités. Et que le patient continue à prendre son traitement. Une autre notion qui est importante, c'est pour les patients qui ne sont pas connus diabétiques, ne pas oublier de dépister le diabète chez ces patients-là et même l'hyperglycémie simplement, pas simplement que le diabète, pour pouvoir gérer ces hyperglycémies et éviter qu'il y ait un sur-risque de complications et de mortalité. Toutes ces données sont sorties de l'article dont on vous a parlé au début, publié dans le Lancet. Thank you, Professor Ekel. Merci beaucoup. And now on to uh, some recent data that has just reached uh, the print uh, in terms of being accessible in the journal. The data I'm referring to are data gathered by Bruce Bodie in the Atlanta area. And Mahmoud, I'm sure you've crossed paths with Bruce yeah. many times in the past. Mm -hmm. This is a survey of hospitalized patients with COVID-19 infection. And here the question relates to ultimately what's the impact of hyperglycemia in the hospital on outcomes. So this is a survey of some uh, 88 US hospitals, I think in eight different states in the United States. Why these places were selected, I don't know for sure. Bruce has not really indicated that to, that to me personally, but nevertheless, here are the data. Diabetes was defined as a hemoglobin A1C greater than 6.5% and uncontrolled hyperglycemia was defined as more than two blood glucoses of greater than 180 milligrams per deciliter, or I presume 10 millimolar, within any 24-hour period after hospitalization. So in this table to the right, we're looking at patients with diabetes and or uncontrolled hyperglycemia that are defined as stated on the left part of the slide. And on the right are patients without diabetes or uncontrolled hyperglycemia. So this group is about a 40-60 split. So what we're looking at is the number of patients in each group in terms of a percentage, again, nearly 40 and uh, well here, I think 74% of the patients in this cohort, in fact, uh, ultimately were defined as no diabetes and uncontrolled hyperglycemia. 
I suspect that maybe there's an error in the math there. The, the gender distribution uh, is about 60% men in the left and, and about 53% in the right. Median age, uh, a little bit higher for people with diabetes and uncontrolled hyperglycemia. That's statistically significant at a P of 005. BMI is a, a little bit higher, not much. That shouldn't really affect outcome. Mean A1C is quite different, 8.7 and 5.8 in the two groups. Notice 5.8, not 5.4 or 5.3. And uh, diabetes by A1C criteria, interestingly enough, was only 17% of that population. So what we're having here is a lot of people with uncontrolled glycemia is defined by at least two plasma glucoses above 180 milligrams per deciliter. And on the right, expectedly, nobody in that group had diabetes or uncontrolled hyperglycemia by definition. So what we're looking now, again, is the distribution of the subjects. Those who died in the hospital, we're looking at the table on the left with diabetes or uncontrolled hyperglycemia or without diabetes or uncontrolled hyperglycemia. And death was 29% with those with diabetes or uncontrolled hyperglycemia and just 6% in those without hyperglycemia. Discharge alive from the hospital was reduced to 70% approximately of those with diabetes or uncontrolled hyperglycemia and nearly 95% in patients who did not have diabetes or uncontrolled hyperglycemia. And that data is reflected on the table, I'm sorry, the graph to the right. 29% in patients with hyperglycemia or diabetes and just 6% with those without. But here's something I find incredibly interesting is if we're looking now at people who were defined as having diabetes, based on a historic A1C of greater than 6.5, the ultimate mortality was in fact 15%. But if you looked at those with uncontrolled hyperglycemia with no known history of diabetes, 42%. And that data really surprises me. But I think what it does say is it says that glucose concentrations in our hospitalized patients with or without diabetes has a very significant impact on mortality. So I think it begs the question, can we ethically randomize people to better control of their glucose when they're in the hospital, when we know that these kind of data are right there before us? You don't have to have diabetes to have a worse outcome. You in fact, just have to have hyperglycemia within the hospital. Now, of course, the purist would say randomized controlled trial data would say we need to control people with hyperglycemia more aggressively than we have before because of this relationship. These data have not been validated, nor does it you know, look at confounding illnesses that really may relate to uncontrolled hyperglycemia that may be important to predict a very unfavorable outcome, specifically all-cause mortality. So we'll leave you with that data to make decisions about the management of your patients. But I don't know about you, when I have a patient hospitalized with diabetes and glycemia is out of line, I want to control their glucose is somewhere in a range of 110 to 180. And I think the guidelines in general from the ADA in terms of the medical standards of care would say that 140 to, over, to 180 is that very comfortable range or optimal range whereas 110 may be a little too low in approaching the risk for hypoglycemia. But nevertheless, think about the way these patients are managed in the hospital. Glucose monitoring may not be that capable in many patients because of the fact that they've now been out of the ICU and they're back on the floor and their you know, nursing staff just can't keep up with all the finger sticks that are necessary. Again, back to the important point of continuous glucose monitoring. En français, s'il vous plaît. Alors, euh, une question très importante sur l'impact de la glycémie euh, par rapport aux complications euh, et la mortalité. Euh, Monsieur Eckel a rapporté une étude euh, très intéressante sur euh, 1122 patients euh, qui euh, ont comparé euh, deux groupes. Il faut savoir que euh, ce sont des datas qui sont euh, les plus récentes en fait et qui, dans cette étude, le diabète a été diagnostiqué, comme d'habitude, avec une hémoglobine glycée supérieure à 6,5%, mais également lorsqu'il y avait dans le monitoring deux glycémies plasmatiques, 
qui dépassait 1,80 g, donc 1,8 g par litre pendant les 24 heures. Ceci définissait un diabète déséquilibré. Donc, lorsqu'il a comparé les deux groupes, il a retrouvé 28,8% de mortalité chez les patients diabétiques et ou qui étaient déséquilibrés avec une hyperglycémie versus 6,2% de mortalité chez les non-diabétiques ou les patients équilibrés. Et il est important également de rapporter une autre donnée. Parmi ces patients, les pa il y avait 71% des patients diabétiques qui ont pu sortir de l'hôpital, donc 71% de patients non décédés lorsqu'on va regarder les diabétiques, versus 95% de sujets euh, qui sont sortis de l'hôpital euh, et qui étaient euh, donc vivants euh, lorsque dans le second groupe. Donc il est très important et ceci dénote de l'importance de l'équilibre glycémique pendant l'hospitalisation qui pourrait réduire le risque de mortalité. Et euh, le professeur Eckel a posé une question éthique. Euh, cette question éthique, c'est est-ce qu'on a le droit de randomiser les patients en deux groupes ou est-ce qu'on devrait au contraire intensifier l'autosurveillance glycémique, mais aussi euh, l'équilibre du diabète pendant l'hospitalisation pour espérer euh, diminuer ces risques de complications et de mortalité. Et donc de garder des glycémies peut-être pas inférieures à 1,10 g où l'hypoglycémie euh, serait possible, mais euh, en tout cas inférieure à 1,80 g pour que le patient puisse euh, bénéficier des avantages par rapport à, euh, au risque de, de, de l'hyperglycémie sur le Covid. C'est bien sûr des résultats tirés de cette étude, mais euh, qui paraissent intéressants en termes de pratiques cliniques euh, au quotidien aujourd'hui. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. All right, now to a very important question relate to, relates to diabetes management and hospitalized patients and drugs that they may be on at home and also drugs where choices need to be made within the hospital environment. I'm going to turn again to the uh, global paper uh, by uh, Professor Bornstein and the rest of the group that relates to drug management in hospitalized patients with diabetes and COVID-19 infection, specifically this table relating to metformin and SGLT2 inhibitors. You know, metformin probably can be continued in the hospital setting but we need to be recognizing that many people who are sick are already somewhat ketotic. They may not be acidotic, but they've not eaten more recently. And I think the GI symptoms accompanying COVID-19 infection are being increasingly recognized. So because of the potential risk for dehydration, uh, ultimately, and some ketosis, ultimately the risk for lactic acidosis could be higher, particularly if patients are not well hydrated. Secondly, during illness, renal function can sometimes be uh, impaired and needs to be carefully monitored. And we certainly know that metformin can be used in people with renal dysfunction as low as stage uh, three to four uh, acute or chronic kidney disease. But nevertheless, this is certainly a cautionary note. And many times when people are dehydrated, they have pre-renal acetemia, which can be adequately corrected by adequate fluid management. So anyway, metformin's probably a keeper, but it needs to be recognized in the setting in which these patients present. Now the SGLT2 inhibitors, and I'm going to uh, come come back to that in a second with an ending comment. But these include, I'm not sure what's approved in in the Middle East or in North Africa, but these include canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, and empagliflozin. And by the way, as you well know, I'm sure these these three drugs have all shown an impact on cardiovascular disease and events in patients with high risk or with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and diabetes. But these drugs in the setting of a risk of dehydration can cause diabetic ketoacidosis. And the endocrinologists, and I think some primary care physicians need to recognize that the difference between diabetic ketoacidosis in a patient on these medications versus those who are not on these medications is the fact that plasma glucose is often not that elevated because the way these drugs work, of course, is they modify renal glucose excretion. So if the patient presents as dehydrated, you know, in fluid imbalance with uh, electrolyte disorders, and now are ultimately, you know, a, having a glucose that's moderately elevated, but perhaps not as high as the 180 we mentioned earlier, DKA could clearly be precipitated by patients who remain on an SGLT2 inhibitor. 
So I think ultimately patients should avoid initiating new therapy during a respiratory illness such as COVID-19. And of course, renal function should be carefully monitored always in hospitalized patients. And acute kidney injury would be possible in the setting of using these agents with a very low EGFR. So in general, I think the paper and, and my opinion uh, and the ADA's opinion would be that these drugs probably should not be implemented or continued in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 and diabetes. Now here's the rabbit trail I mentioned at the beginning of my comments about the SRT2 inhibitors. Mikhail Kasurbarov, who's a, a cardiologist who does a lot of diabetes related research, specifically clinical trials, is now doing a study, I think called DARE, D-A-R-E. I don't know exactly what that stands for, but dapagliflozin is the drug he's using. He's administering this in a randomized control manner to patients hospitalized with COVID-19 infection with diabetes. And ultimately, you know, many of us in, in the diabetes space are quite concerned about that study. But he's a bold guy, a very zealous cardiologist who really feels comfortable in treating diabetes. So I'm hopeful that that trial is at least not harmful. And if it's beneficial, I would be surprised. But his rationale for treatment is protecting the kidney, which in fact, these drugs do to some extent. But also he's thinking about cardiomyopathy, which may be a complication of COVID-19 infection. And he feels these drugs by modifying uh, cardiac efficiency favorably will be perhaps more effective in preventing heart failure or death from congestive heart failure in our patients with diabetes. Now, the second group of drugs listed here are the GLP-1 receptor agonists, the DPP-4 inhibitors, and insulin. The GLP-1 receptor agonists, I think, are drugs that work mostly, I think, through the paracrine effects on insulin secretion by modifying uh, glucagon uh, levels, perhaps uh, effectively. And uh, ultimately, these drugs are, are often useful too because of the reduced food intake that occurs with it and the weight loss. There's no reason to think that a patient who's probably not very hungry should have these agents continued within a hospital setting. But nevertheless, you know, you could choose to continue them. But I think that's probably not the most appropriate way or a good choice for our hospitalized patients. Again, the issue of electro electrolyte and fluid balance is an important consideration. Now the DPP-4 inhibitors, one thing we can say about these drugs is they're pretty safe and adverse effects are extremely unusual. And because they're so well tolerated and they have a modest glucose lowering effect, the, the committee didn't really feel that there's any reason that we should raise any signal related to continuing the DPP-4 inhibitors in our patients with diabetes who are hospitalized. And finally, insulin. Patients who are insulin treated as an outpatient, you cannot stop their insulin when they're hospitalized. Insulin must be continued. And in some patients who remain on the ward, certainly subcutaneous insulin administration is very appropriate, not requiring intravenous insulin administration. Of course, having in continuous glucose monitoring is a nice tool to avoid undue risk to the healthcare professionals and also allow the patient her or himself to help manage their own diabetes. And as we know, uh, in patients with type one diabetes, sometimes they're their best physician rather than us who are in the healthcare provider mode. So again, insulin doses may need to be adjusted depending on the extent of the illness and the degree of hyperglycemia. And remembering the data from Bruce Bodie I just showed you, I think better glycemic control is certainly indicated in our hospitalized patients. And here are some things I don't think we need to review in more detail. I've covered them pretty much in the slide that I showed previously, but just some, some issues that relate the guidelines related to the many drugs we have our patients on as outpatients when they're hospitalized. Now, if you want really an algorithm to turn to, I'm not gonna read these, they're too small to read, but I just wanted to show you the website and how Diabetes UK deals with this issue of COVID-19 in hospitalized patients with diabetes. So this, if you will, is a series of algorithms and recommendations that you can turn to if you want something in print that gives you the ABCs of management of diabetes in hospitalized patients. Now, let's turn to a very controversial topic that came up from a letter to the editor, I believe in the Lancet, about the fact that because viral entry occurs through the ACE protein, shown on the left of this slide, so here's the ACE2 protein, the idea that virus entry 
is mediated in part by the AC protein and ultimately replication and ACE down regulation ensues. So the question comes up, because these drugs we use commonly to treat hypertension or may also be utilized to treat renal disease, proteinuria and beyond, or also post-myocardial infarction, at least for a period of two to five years, should these drugs be stopped? And now I'm pleased to report that there are, a, a, I think, up to five studies. I saw two new ones today that suggested that if we continue the ACE inhibitors and ARBs in our patients when they're hospitalized, that there's no harm from doing so. In fact, one study showed a beneficial effect of continuing these agents versus not continuing these agents. So here's just an example of one study published in Circulation Research a couple of weeks ago. So here's patients continuing uh, or not on the ACE inhibitors or ARBs, and these are people on the ACE inhibitors or ARBs. And here's a graphic showing how the impact of hypertension as a risk factor for death and the benefit of continuing these agents on the outcome. And whether this is because blood pressures are more favorably controlled and that's why they have a better outcome or there are other properties of these medications that confer benefit. But nevertheless, I think the data are now replete with five studies, including this one, that show the continuation of these agents should, uh, should be uh, carefully heeded and patients may do better, in fact, on these agents with no harm apparent in this fairly large study recently published in a very high impact peer reviewed journal. So now finally, a comment about hydroxychloroquine. I'm not sure what's going on on in your countries in relationship to the use of this drug. Uh, uh, the President of the United States has been kind of a proponent of using this drug somewhat recklessly in treating patients, and I'm not being critical of, of his opinion, but the idea is this, like any other intervention, requires randomized controlled trial studies. And I'm pleased to report from Tony Fauci, who is the kind of the NIH head of this whole COVID-19 scenario, uh, he's head of the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease. Tony has reported two days ago that a global study looking at remdesivir, which is an antiviral agent, now looks promising in, from randomized controlled trial data of improving outcomes. We don't have any such data yet with hydroxychloroquine, but here are just a couple of things to mention in relationship to treating patients with type 2 diabetes or perhaps type 1 diabetes and COVID-19 infection. Beware of hypoglycemia. This takes me back to my early faculty days at the University of Colorado, where Jerry Oleski, who is a renowned diabetologist, who uh, ultimately was involved very much in the studies of insulin receptor regulation at that time, showed convincingly that hydroxychloroquine modifies lysosomal degradation of the insulin receptor, which favorably returns the insulin receptor to its plasma membrane to confer additional action that relates to insulin sensitivity. So from those studies, it reminded me that ultimately clinical application of hydroxychloroquine, whether it be for malaria prophylaxis or therapeutics, can be putting people at risk for hypoglycemia. And there's a series of reports out there about patients with or without diabetes, with or without insulin therapy, who can develop hypoglycemia when treated with hydroxychloroquine. And the other important aspect of hydroxychloroquine is because QTC intervals are prolonged with hydroxychloroquine. And I'm quoting the authors of this paper in the Canadian Journal of Cardiology of baseline ECG testing reveals a moderately prolonged QTC. Optimization of medications and electrolytes may permit ongoing hydroxychloroquine therapy. But if the QTC is markedly prolonged, drugs which further prolong it should be avoided or expert consultation may permit administration with mitigating precautions. So keep in mind, this may be proven to be an effective drug for modification of the natural history of COVID-19 in the presence or absence of diabetes, but there is a little bit of a cautionary note if you're gonna use this before we have evidence for benefit. So if you will, en français, we're gonna look at the risks and the benefits of giving medications related to diabetes. Hen, merci, uh, merci, beaucoup. merci beaucoup. Euh, par rapport aux thérapeutiques des patients diabétiques atteints du COVID-19, il faut comprendre qu'à cause des manifestations gastro-intestinales 
euh, du Covid-19, il y a beaucoup de risques de déshydratation qui euh, vont impacter euh, les thérapies euh, et également la fonction rénale, cardiaque, comme vous l'imaginez bien. Concernant la metformine, la metformine, euh, à cause de la déshydratation eh bien, euh, et le risque d'acidose lactique et également d'insuffisance rénale aiguë, il est euh, préférable d'arrêter euh, ce traitement euh, comme on fait d'habitude lorsqu'il y a une autre cause de déshydratation. Même chose pour les SGLT2 inhibiteurs qui sont des traitements disponibles aujourd'hui, que ce soit en prévention secondaire pour protéger le cœur et le rein, mais aussi en prévention primaire chez les patients à haut risque cardiovasculaire, eh bien, les SGLT2 inhibiteurs ont, en plus de ce risque de déshydratation et d'insuffisance rénale aiguë, un risque dans cette situation infectieuse de décompensation cétoacidosique à glycémie normale, d'où l'intérêt de continuer le monitoring à la fois glycémique mais aussi urinaire pour ces patients lorsqu'ils sont en ambulatoire, mais lorsque le patient est hospitalisé et atteint de Covid-19, eh bien, il faut que ce traitement soit arrêté par précaution. De la même façon que les agonistes de récepteurs au GLP1 de par la déshydratation, eh bien, sont, euh, importants, euh, il est important de les surveiller de façon attentive et euh, surtout d'encourager l'hydratation. Les inhibiteurs de la DPP4 sont par contre bien tolérés, ils ne présentent pas d'effets indésirables et donc les patients peuvent continuer à les poursuivre euh, sans risque. L'insuline est très importante. Comme on, on l'a rappelé plusieurs fois aujourd'hui, il ne faut jamais, jamais arrêter l'insuline lorsque celle-ci est déjà, euh, lorsque le patient est déjà traité par insuline. Par contre, à cause du Covid-19, il va y avoir un risque euh, d'augmentation de, des glycémies et donc nous devons ajuster, adapter les doses pour que le patient garde des glycémies dans des intervalles normales et encourager les glycémies capillaires répétées, rapprochées et bien entendu les CGMS. Alors par rapport aux antihypertenseurs, les IEC et les ARA2, il y a eu une grande polémique parce que le récepteur ACE est reconnu par le virus SARS-CoV-2 et c'est d'ailleurs grâce à ce récepteur que le virus va pouvoir rentrer dans les cellules. Donc au début, euh, il y a eu des, euh, des, 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 des suppositions que ces traitements pouvaient être nocifs. Or, pas du tout. Il faut continuer et garder ces antihypertenseurs, notamment les IEC et les ARA2. Il n'y a pas de risque supplémentaire par rapport au COVID-19. Et en plus, le fait de garder ces antihypertenseurs va permettre d'équilibrer la pression artérielle et de diminuer les euh, risques globaux. Enfin, l'hydroxychloroquine qui est utilisée dans certains pays, comme le Maroc d'ailleurs, il n'y a pas d'évidence based medicine pour dire que c'est une thérapie qu'il faut mettre d'emblée chez les patients diabétiques ou non atteints de Covid-19, mais il y a des études contrôlées randomisées en cours. Par contre, il est important de faire attention notamment aux risques d'hypoglycémie qui peuvent être engendrés par ces traitements chez les sujets diabétiques, mais également faire attention à monitorer les ECG pour les personnes qui les prennent à cause de l'intervalle QT. Maintenant, cette thérapie n'est à l'heure actuelle pas recommandée par des preuves solides d'évidence based medicine. Thank you. All right, now to conclude uh, very quickly, and uh, you've been very patient uh, living through my internet interruption here. I thank you all for that. So let's conclude then. Our patients with diabetes at an increased risk for COVID-19, the evidence at this point is insufficient. We think so, but we don't have evidence to prove that. I think special precautions need to take place in our patient population, but nevertheless, they may or may not be at increased risk. Our patients with diabetes with COVID-19 infection at increased risk for hospitalization, ICU admission with or without assisted ventilation and mortality. Yes, and I'm gonna approximate the global data as I best understand it, about three times more likely for all of these, hospitalization, admission to an ICU or assisted ventilation with or without assisted ventilation and all cause mortality. Considerations for patients with diabetes who require hospitalization 
advise patients to know their meds, maybe take them with them to make sure they're well accounted for, bring their pumps and CGM devices with them. The impact of hyperglycemia now from one study has provided evidence that hyperglycemia is harmful and I think ultimately may be more harmful in people who don't know they have diabetes than those that do. I think randomized controlled trials are not necessary here. We need to control plasma glucose in our hospitalized patients with or without diabetes. And finally, with all the drugs that we've just summarized uh, here, I think we need to stop the SGLT2 inhibitors, the GLP-1 receptor agonists, and for some patients, not all, perhaps the metformin. Continue the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs, the DPP-4 inhibitors, and of course, insulin in people treated with insulin in the outpatient area. And I think we need to await randomized controlled trials for hydroxychloroquine. And by the way, there are apparently over 150 drugs being developed and tested in patients with COVID-19 with or without diabetes. And hopefully we'll have some remdesivir experiences repeated for other medications. So keep in mind all of these things as we approach our patients with diabetes. En français, s'il vous plaît. Pour conclure sur les points essentiels, sur les cinq questions abordées, est-ce que les diabétiques sont à risque élevé de contracter le COVID-19 Il n'y a vraiment pas de preuve pour l'instant pour le dire. Par contre, les diabétiques sont, euh, trois, ont trois fois plus de risques euh, d'être hospitalisés en unité de soins intensifs euh, ou d'avoir des infections aiguës ou une mortalité. Enfin, par rapport à la conduite à tenir pratique, L'éducation thérapeutique, sensibiliser les patients, que ce soit les patients euh, euh, qui ne sont pas hospitalisés en unité de soins intensifs, mais aussi les patients euh, en réanimation, sur l'importance de garder les traitements, notamment l'insuline. Vous avez vu euh, également que les contrôles glycémiques sont euh, importants et les pompes à insuline ainsi que les CGMS sont à privilégier. Euh, la question de l'impact de l'hyperglycémie sur les événements est claire. Il faut que l'équilibre glycémique soit là. Il n'y a pas besoin d'études contrôlées randomisées. Euh, le, les complications peuvent être plus importantes chez des patients qui ne se savent pas diabétiques avec des hyperglycémies plutôt que des patients diabétiques bien équilibrés. Donc le degré d'hyperglycémie est important et il faut diminuer les glycémies de nos patients. Par rapport aux thérapeutiques, nous avons euh, bien vu qu'il fallait arrêter la metformine, les SGLT2 inhibiteurs et les agonistes du récepteur au GLP1, poursuivre et surtout préciser aux patients qui ne doivent pas arrêter ces traitements, les IEC, les ARA2, l'insuline et les inhibiteurs de la DPP4 et euh, par précaution entendre les études contrôlées randomisées pour prescrire l'hydroxychloroquine et je vous remercie. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bob and the hand for this beautiful translation. I now can give lectures in French if you need any help, help okay? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, I don't know is it fortunate or not, but I have dozens of questions. So, Bob, I need very short answers and the hand please do very fast translation, if you may, please. Maya Younes is actually asking about the uh, role of stem cell therapy. I believe maybe she is referring to the convalescent plasma, Bob? Well, the uh, benefit of uh, you know, post-infection plasma um, for treat this condition is anecdotal at this point. There have been cases treated with uh, post-infective plasma where in fact, the antibodies have been uh, isolated and purified and re-administered uh, to other patients with active infection. So there are cases that have shown benefit. Um, but in, in general, this is anecdotal at this point. There's been no RCT to clearly demonstrate the benefit. And just like a lot of other interventions, there are anecdotal reports of everything. We just don't know whether they're valuable. Now, stem cells, uh, I, I presume, uh, I mean, what kind of stem cells would you use? Would you use stem cells that are involved in uh, the generation of, of, of white cells? And in fact, you know, the white cell count often is, is demonstrable of increased risk. So typically these patients have uh, a reduced neutrophil count and sometimes a reduced lymphocyte count that tends to predict worse outcomes. So, uh, you know, other than that, I don't know what else to say about stem cells. 
And the very fast translation, please. Very fast. La question uh, qui a été posée, c'est est-ce qu'il y avait un bénéfice au plasma purifié des patients déjà infectés En fait, il n'y a aucune étude contrôlée randomisée et uh, comme il n'y a pas de, de ce genre d'étude, ça reste juste des anecdotes. Il ne faut pour l'instant pas du tout uh, se pencher sur uh, cette thérapie uh, après, pour, pour l'instant, pour le COVID-19. Dr. Hirsch is actually asking about the difference between people with type 1 and type 2. Is there any different presentation or different outcome? I wish I could answer that question. The reason is that hospitalization is just being defined presence of diabetes or no diabetes in terms of the literature that's out there. I don't think we have anything special to share about type 1, but I would presume that uh, there are a lot of issues that relate to type 1 and type 2, both including mostly age, male sex tends to do worse, and also duration of diabetes. And I think type 1s who have 50 or 60 years of diabetes are also older. So the question is, which is more important? So I don't think we have a clear answer about any distinctive uh, differences in evaluation or treatment of those two types of diabetes. Ken? Euh, Est-ce qu'il y avait une différence entre les patients diabétiques de type 1 et diabétiques de type 2 euh, La réponse est euh, on ne sait pas parce que dans les études, il y était marqué simplement diabétique ou non diabétique. Par contre, euh, ce qui est important de noter, c'est que ce qui influe, c'est l'âge, le sexe masculin, mais aussi la durée du diabète et le déséquilibre du diabète. Donc forcément, un diabétique qui va avoir une longue durée d'évolution du diabète euh, et qui est âgé risque d'avoir, euh, bien entendu, des complications, à l'instar d'un diabétique de type 2 qui est habituellement un âge plus avancé. Mariam Balkasi is asking about this uh, worse outcome. Uh, do you think it is due to blood clotting, low immunity or whatever? Well, I think I can only speculate on why there's a worse outcome. I think it tends to relate to multi-system disease. Uh, typically, um, diabetes is not the only risk factor for poor outcomes. It includes hypertension, often heart disease, and I'm sure uh, age and male sex, again, are needed to be repeated as important predictors of outcomes. So uh, I think uh, the question is, what's death due to? ARDS, typically. I mean, most people die a respiratory death. By the way, there's some evidence in the cardiovascular disease literature that myocardial infarction may be more frequent in these patients. And some forms of myocarditis may develop too. So there are a wide variety of ways people with diabetes leave us uh, in COVID-19 space. But nevertheless, I think it's coexisting disease, male sex and age being most important. And Alors, euh, la question c'est, est-ce euh, qu'on peut expliquer justement pourquoi est-ce que ces patients vont avoir euh, des complications euh, simplement par le diabète Eh bien non, d'abord, euh, le diabète euh, est une maladie qui a de multiples origines et euh, le diabète à lui seul euh, n'est pas le seul facteur de risque souvent chez ces patients. Il y a aussi euh, l'âge, le sexe, l'HPA, etc. Et euh, donc, euh, on ne peut juste spéculer. Euh, par contre, ce qui est important, c'est qu'on remarque qu'il y a plus d'infarctus du myocarde chez euh, ces patients. Euh, et donc, les multiples facteurs de risque peuvent être euh, probablement à l'origine. Pour l'instant, il n'y a pas de réponse claire à cette question. Azim Saïd is asking about these serious complications could lead to uh, DKA. What type of complications, Mamou? The complications of, of uh, COVID-19. Could lead to what? I'm could sorry. precipitate diabetic ketoacidosis. Oh, I think so, for sure. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I have um, a comment now. It, it's an acknowledgement actually from Dr. Hamdoun Balhassani. Hamdoun is actually the president of the Moroccan Diabetes Association. Mm -hmm. And this, he is addressing a special thank you to Bob Ekel. But I don't know, he didn't acknowledge him. He will be in a trouble, maybe. <laughs> well, anyway. I have, I, I'm sure I would have met him in Morocco a month ago. That <laughs> continued. So look, again, my Magdi apologies uh, for the internet interruption, but I'm glad we could get through it. I hope it happened. It happened, Bob, don't worry. Okay. Uh, Magdi Abdelaziz is asking about any anti-diabetic drug which could precipitate or uh, predispose to the infection of COVID-19? I think you answered this. No, I, I can't think of any drug that would predispose to infection, though. No. And? 
je vais juste traduire rapidement. Est-ce que les complications du Covid-19 peuvent entraîner une décompensation cétoacidosique Clairement oui, parce que c'est une infection et donc euh, la glycémie s'élève. Par contre, est-ce que euh, des médicaments peuvent entraîner euh, un sur-risque de Covid-19 euh, Non, euh, pas du tout. Il n'y a pas de médicaments qui puissent entraîner, euh, euh, il n'y a pas de relation de cause à effet. Uh, well, I have a lot, a lot of questions from maybe as a Bakri, Gamal, Belkhadr, blah, 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 and myself, Bob, because maybe you will be in a trouble because, you know, in this area, uh, I can tell uh, at least 80 to 85% of people with type 2 diabetes are actually treated with sulfonylureas. And I believe you didn't mention a single yeah. word about sulfonylureas. Yeah, it, it, looking back at the manuscript that I was part of, I, I really um, think we made a mistake in not addressing sulfonylureas. Um, I think if in a hospitalized setting where in fact food intake may be modified, the patient's sick, maybe in the ICU, uh, sulfonylureas, I think, Uh, ultimately are displaced by insulin management. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, I think in general, giving an oral drug, unless the patient's really pretty well and ends up in the hospital anyway, uh, the sulfonylurea probably should be stopped at admission with the possibility the patient may reach the ICU and ultimately need to be managed with insulin to control their glucose in the hospital. But you're, you're correct. I didn't mention it because the paper didn't go there. And I, you know, I think the paper made a mistake really in not addressing the sulfurias. So. Yeah. Maria, Maria uh, Amal is actually raising an important issue about the healthcare providers who are actually uh, having type 2 diabetes or even type 1. Should they still practice and see uh, people with COVID-19? Well, I think there's uh, more risk there. I think in general, Uh, age 65 and above is uh, putting people at risk, not that it, when you're 64, you're not, or 66, you are. I mean, people are relatively well uh, managed at, at those two ages that are just two years apart. So, but in general, 65 and above is where about 85 or 90% of the mortality is seen. Uh, patients with diabetes who are treating patients, I think, need to uh, wear masks, although I don't know of controlled data that shows the benefit, but nevertheless, it's being recommended. Uh, and I think this special caution and going to telemedicine or other means of communication with their patients makes a lot of sense. And? La question, il y avait deux questions. D'abord, la question sur les sulfamides euh, qui n'ont pas été abordées dans l'article. Le professeur Eckel a dit que c'était euh, un oubli et probablement une erreur. Mais en tous les cas, qu'il fallait les arrêter lorsque les patients étaient hospitalisés et bien entendu euh, passer à l'insuline. La deuxième question, c'était par rapport à l'âge physiologique et l'âge chronologique, parce que finalement, 62, 63, 65 ans, ça peut, être, ça peut être pareil, mais aussi différent. Et donc, il faut faire attention beaucoup aussi à l'âge physiologique. En tous les cas, les diabétiques doivent porter des masques, c'est une recommandation, et également utiliser la télémédecine plutôt que être de, de médecine de proximité en face à face. Bob, you talked about telemedicine, and um, I can see now that there is a trend in these uh, countries here in the Middle East to use this uh, uh, telemedicine or telehealth during this uh, COVID-19 era. But I'm just wondering, what do you think when we are talking about diabetes care, what could be done with the telehealth and what could not be done? Well, um, you know, that I'm not really kind of a political economist here and uh, clearly not uh, trained in sociology, but, you know, there, there are pockets of the population who live in rural areas, who are underserved, who don't have access, may not even have internet, so the telemedicine doesn't work under those circumstances. So that needs to be more proactive outreach by hospital systems or clinics uh, to reach these people more directly. Uh, in terms of their evaluation of care. It's amazing to me as someone who's been seeing patients for a long time, how many visits really are beneficial for the human interaction at the time of the visit. But much of what's accomplished there could take place through you know, telemedicine or activities such as Zoom or GoToMeeting or other kind of telecommunication capabilities. Uh, I really miss the human interaction 
that occurs in the clinic. And I think patients really like that. But yet I think when you have a, 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 an optical capability of seeing your physician or as a healthcare provider, seeing your patient and being able to communicate the way we are here this evening in Egypt, uh, it, it's much more advantageous. But there are clearly populations who will not be capable of being adequately reached under the circumstances. You know, one thing that's happening in the US and I perhaps believe around the world is the absence of income that relates, of course, in socialized medical uh, countries, that's a little bit different, I'm sure. But in, in the US, uh, ultimately, the income coming from outpatient visits is substantial and is really very important in sustaining, you know, kind of medical school economy, uh, not only for the hospital systems and the clinics, but also for the medical center itself. So, you know, we, we got to think about a new way to do things that becomes cost effective and capable of sustaining the systems the way we've known them for years. This coronavirus pandemic really has a major impact on how we're going to behave going forward. That's and a long answer. Mm -hmm. Short comment, yeah. please, Anne. Uh, yeah. La question de la télémédecine, uh, alors le professeur Eckel a dit que d'abord il dit c'était important aussi par rapport à, au volet économique, même s'il n'était pas expert en économie, euh, et qu'il y a aussi les possibilités individuelles des patients qui ont ou pas Internet, accès à Internet. La question qui se pose, c'est euh, combien de consultations par an on, sont nécessaires en direct avec le patient, avec l'interaction Est-ce qu'on en a besoin tous les euh, trois mois, par exemple, ou est-ce qu'on peut euh, se, se suffire de, de moins et d'avoir euh, des, des consultations par télémédicine donc la communication et l'interaction entre le médecin et le patient, c'est quand même important, il ne faut pas l'oublier et donc cette crise du coronavirus va nous faire réfléchir peut-être sur un autre système avec un mix entre les, co les consultations en direct et la télémédecine. Ok, let me, because of maybe uh, of the interest of time, we need to, to conclude now, but let me, let me address a final and actually very important question. I don't know if Bob maybe and or myself can have an answer. He is actually asking about the big discrepancy in the number of cases and the mortality between this, the so-called uh, developed countries, uh, US and Europe, and uh, with people, for example, in the MENA region, in the Middle East, there's a big discrepancy in these numbers. Uh, is there any explanation? I've not seen data from the Middle Eastern part of the world in terms of this infection. I mean, all the data is coming from China, from parts of Europe, and by the way, not much data from Europe yet, a little bit from South Korea, and I have a colleague who I communicated with this morning in South Korea who brought me up to date a little bit, but none of this has been peer reviewed or published. So I, I think, you know, clearly North Africa and, and the Middle East, we don't have enough numbers to really make a comment. So I'd like to see a more zealous uh, series of activities going forward to allow that data to be available so we can make more selective comments. And uh, it's not only translation because I need to, to hear from you yeah. in English first yeah. and then you can translate. Okay, okay, Mahmoud. Uh, in, in Morocco, we have uh, less cases and uh, we have uh, no explanation. Uh, maybe because uh, uh, there were uh, an, an anticipation uh, with the country because uh, we, uh, everybody is at home uh, and uh, everybody is, uh, has to have put a mask or uh, they go to jail. So it's, uh, it's a military uh, system now. Uh, and maybe it is uh, one of the reasons why uh, we have uh, less uh, uh, less uh, people with the COVID-19. Uh, maybe. Uh, uh, Bob, let me let me a little bit uh, disagree with you about the data because I can see in these countries official data supervised by the WHO, uh, and I don't know uh, because you know, for example, I am now stuck in Egypt, as you know. And I can, I can tell up to the moment and according to the data published by the WHO and the Egyptian authorities, uh, we are talking about less than 6,000 uh, recorded uh, uh, registered cases uh, 
mm. with almost a 400 mortality. So uh, uh, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, uh, apparently, there is a big discrepancy between what is happening in the Middle East or even Africa and what's going on in, in some European countries, not all Europe and the United States. To clarify what you just said, you said 600 cases and what 6,000, 6,000 6, and 400. Yeah, but, but to be honest with you, the yeah. number of testing is extremely less than the US. Yes. But you know, you know, you can be mistaken by the number of cases, but you cannot be mistaken by the number of deaths. You see what yeah. I mean? Mm -hmm. Right. Of course, there are targeted areas where populations are more dense, like New York City and New Orleans and uh, areas uh, such as that, the big cities, the urban areas, uh, more so in some of the socioeconomically uh, diverse populations. So, you know, that it's fairly regional. There are places in the U.S. have very little uh, exposure and cases and death. Uh, but there are other places, again, that are more uh, urbanized and more uh, you know, social distance deprived that ultimately have a lot more. So, can it? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you a lot, uh, uh, Bob, for your time. And uh, thanks, Hand. You did great. And uh, I should congratulate you to your good job. Thanks for the attendees. Thanks for your spot. And uh, see you again. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. bye. bye.